my Gewandin folks. Today we have a very interesting integral i characterized by a couple of parameters, alpha and beta, both being positive. So let me just write this out. So alpha and beta are both greater than zero. So we have the integral from zero to infinity of one minus e to the negative alpha x over one plus e to the beta x times x dx. Okay, cool. So I'd like to start off with a transformation and that is letting e to the negative x equal u, which implies that x itself would be negative log u. So differentiating yields dx equal to negative one over u du. Now, as far as the limits are concerned, as x approaches zero, we have u approaching one. And as x approaches infinity, u is to approach zero. So this implies that the target integral i now is the integral from one to zero of one minus u to the alpha over one plus u to the negative beta times x, which is of course now log u with a negative sign. And the differential element is of course negative u, negative du over u that is, so the two negatives do cancel out. But you reintroduce that on switching up the order of the limits of integration. And now you can actually get rid of the negative sign once and for all if we switch up the order of the terms in the numerator of the integrand. So we have u to the alpha minus one. And this looks pretty damn interesting. And I'd now like to treat this purely as a function of alpha holding beta constant. So we have integral zero to one, u to the alpha minus one over one plus u to the negative beta times log u du over u. Now, if we differentiate with respect to alpha, that is we have di over d alpha on the left, and on switching up the order of the integration and differentiation operators, we have the integral from zero to one of the partial derivative with respect to alpha because of the Leibniz rule of u to the alpha minus one over one plus u to the minus beta times log u du over u. Now all the terms independent of alpha are gonna be held constant. So we have the integral from zero to one of, let's see, we should have a one over u log u term and a one plus u to the minus beta term. And on differentiating u to the alpha with respect to alpha, we have u to the alpha times log u and the derivative of one is of course zero. So we have some lovely cancellation of the logarithms and we're left with the integral from zero to one of u to the alpha minus one over, let's see, we're left with one plus u to the negative beta downstairs. And this looks relatively more manageable than the integral we started off with. There's still one more transformation I would like to do. So rather an expansion, I could expand using the multiplicative inverse of u to the negative beta. So I'll expand using u to the beta and u to the beta. So by that token, we have the integral from zero to one of u to the alpha plus beta minus one over u to the beta plus one du. And now one more transformation is in order. I'll let u to the beta equal t or u equals t to the one over beta that is. And this implies that du is equal to one over beta times t to the one over beta minus one dt. And the limits of integration are clearly not bothered. So this implies that i prime of alpha is in fact the integral from zero to one. Uh, let's see, u itself is t to the one over beta. So we have t to the alpha plus beta over beta minus one over beta. And because of the differential element, we have this t to the one over beta minus one term, dt over one plus t. And of course we need a factor of one over beta outside we see some lovely cancellation taking place. And this means that we have one over beta times the integral from zero to one of t to the alpha plus beta over beta, minus one is still there, over one plus t dt. Now you guys know I love special functions and I've derived plenty of integral formulae for special functions. And here's a really cool one. So we're talking about the integral from zero to one of t to the s minus one over one plus t dt 
link in the, in the description box for a proof that this thing equals the digamma function evaluated at s minus digamma of s over 2 minus log 2. So in our case, s is equal to alpha plus beta over 2, which implies that i prime of alpha is in fact 1 over beta times digamma of alpha plus beta over 2. Uh, over beta, that is terribly, sorry about that. And we have a negative sign, alpha plus beta over 2 beta, much better, minus log 2. Okay, cool. So we finally have a form for i prime of alpha. And I'd now like to recover back the integral function, and of course we'll do that by integrating with respect to alpha. So this implies that we have i of alpha equal to, again, beta is being treated as a constant, but how do we integrate the digamma function? Well, we just reference its definition. So digamma of s is actually equal to the derivative with respect to s of log gamma s. In other words, log gamma s, terribly sorry about that, is the antiderivative of the gamma function, which is dope. And finally, that means we have i of alpha equal to 1 over beta outside as a constant, and we have log gamma alpha plus beta over beta divided by the derivative of the argument with respect to alpha, of course. So that should be 1 over beta, and that means we should have some cancellation later, minus log gamma alpha plus beta over 2 beta over 1 over 2 beta this time, and of course we should have minus alpha log 2. And this definitely looks absolutely amazing, but there's something missing. What could it be? Oh yeah, it's the exact reason why I failed my Cal 2 exam back at school. It is the constant of integration plus c. So we do have some cancellation taking place, and so the 1 over beta terms will cancel out, and that means I have i of alpha in the slightly more elegant form. So we have log gamma alpha plus beta over beta minus log gamma, we should have a factor of 1 over 2, so that turns into 2 times log gamma plus gamma of alpha plus beta over 2 beta and of course by log properties we could write this as log of the square of its argument which I'm gonna write as gamma squared alpha plus beta over 2 beta minus alpha over beta times log 2 and now it, of course we need to figure out what exactly is the value of the constant of integration and for that, we will reference back the integral function. So recall that i of alpha was defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 minus e to the negative alpha x. Terribly sorry about that. Over 1 plus e to the beta x over x dx. And alpha and beta are supposed to be positive, but alpha equal to zero would in fact fall into the domain of this integral now that I think of it. So yeah, you could take the limit as alpha tends to zero from the right, or in fact alpha should fall into the domain. So at alpha equal to zero, what we see is that i of zero equals in the numerator of the integrand, we have e to the zero, which is one, one minus one, zero, the entire thing collapses down to zero. So that means the initial value condition we needed was alpha equal to zero, because that gives us zero on the left, and on the right it has uh, log gamma beta over beta, so that is gamma one, which is one, so this thing crashes out because log one is zero, minus log of gamma squared one over two, minus alpha is zero, and then we have a plus c. So this implies that c here equals log gamma squared one half. Now gamma one half is root pi, so that means we have root pi squared, which is of course log of pi. Okay, cool, that looks quite convenient indeed. So we have this i of alpha formula, that is log of, you know what, I might as well combine logarithms now using log properties. So the difference of two logarithms equals the log of the quotient. 
So we have log gamma of alpha plus beta over beta over gamma squared alpha plus beta over 2 beta. And we have this other thing over there that's negative alpha over beta times log 2. I'm going to leave that out for now. Alpha over beta log 2. And wait, we have a log pi. So adding that here gives us pi up here in the numerator of the argument. Okay, cool. This looks absolutely insane, but we can actually clean it up a little bit using the duplication formula for the for the gamma function. And the reason I'm saying that is because you have log of something down here, you have gamma of something that is down here, and you have gamma of twice that something up there. So we might as well reference the duplication formula. Link in the description box for a proof of that. It's actually, that was actually a side quest on the evaluation of a really cool integral I got from Michael Penn a while back. It's the integral of tangent of x to the i, where, yeah, the ith power means, well, i means the imaginary unit, so that is absolutely insane as well. You're gonna like that video. Uh, enough advertising past videos. I'm trying to recall the the duplication formula, which I am searching for in my notes. Oh yeah, here it is. So gamma of 2z equals 2 to the 2z minus 1 times gamma z over gamma z plus 1 half over root pi. And in our case, I would like gamma of 2z over gamma of z. So I might as well just write this as a ratio. So letting z here equal to alpha plus beta over 2 beta, this implies that gamma of alpha plus beta over beta over gamma of alpha plus beta over 2 beta equals 2 to the what now? Oh yeah, that's alpha plus beta over beta minus 1 times gamma of, let's see, alpha plus beta over 2 beta plus one half, what on earth is that gonna turn into? Oh yeah, alpha plus two beta over two beta, that doesn't look half bad, over root pi. And notice that we have two gamma functions in the product over here of alpha plus beta over two b. So I'm just gonna shrink this working down a little bit so I can see things clearly. So all of this implies that i of alpha is in fact log of pi times what exactly? Oh yeah, the ratio equaled 2 uh, to the alpha plus beta over beta minus 1. But wait, if I simplify that, I have plus beta and minus beta up top, and I'm left with alpha over beta, which is very convenient because I have 2 to the alpha over beta over here as well in the other log term with a negative sign, so there will be cancellation. And now for the ratio first. Oh yeah, we have a gamma term of alpha plus two b over two beta over two beta. This whole thing is being divided by root pi. And of course you have a negative log of two to the alpha over beta as well. Let me just separate this out from the main working. And immediately we see that there is this cancellation of the log of 2 to the alpha over beta terms. And we have pi over root pi, which is in fact equal to, oh dear me, I've forgotten terribly, sorry about that. I forgot there was this other gamma function as well. It's gamma alpha plus beta over 2 beta, that's it. And this implies, finally, that i of alpha or I should just give myself a bit more writing space and write i of alpha and beta, of course, equals log of root pi times gamma of alpha plus two beta over two beta over gamma of alpha plus beta over two beta, which is an absolutely gorgeous looking result involving gamma functions. And it's actually interesting when you let alpha and beta equal the same thing. So if we let alpha equal to beta, we have i of alpha equal to log of root pi times gamma of, 
Uh, you're gonna have three alpha up top and two alpha downstairs. So that's gamma three halves over gamma, wait, um, two alpha over two alpha, that's just one, which is interesting which, because now it doesn't matter what alpha is. So as long as the two numbers are equal, it doesn't matter what they are, you will always have the same result. And that is log root pi. Gamma three halves is one half of root pi and gamma one half is, and gamma one is just one. So you have log pi over two and that prompts us to write some interesting results for some very, very important constants. So if alpha equals beta equals 69, or alpha equals beta equals 420, or alpha equals beta equals 666. In any case, you will get i equal to pi over 2, and that looks pretty gnarly if you write it in integral form. I mean, check it out. We have the integral from 0 to infinity, 1 minus e to the negative 69x over 1 plus e to the 69x times x, dx equals log pi over 2. I mean, if you whip this out at a party, yeah, you're going to be the life of the party itself. I mean, uh, you're going to get a girlfriend. I mean, you're going to be the most popular kid in school. And then you'll probably wake up. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.